Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Ryan Galloway, and I am the Director of Debate at Sanford University. And I am going to be talking to you about the death penalty, which is one of the affirmatives in your packet. And I'm going to talk about this in three parts. The first part of this lecture, which is available as its own video, is the state of the death penalty in the United States today. How many people get it? How do you get it? Etc. And then the second lecture is going to be affirmative advantages to a death penalty case, debating the death penalty on the affirmative, why it's a strategic affirmative, what specific advantages you can claim to a death penalty case. And then the third lecture will be going negative against the death penalty. So let's begin by talking about the death penalty in the United States. The first thing to know is that the federal government does have the death penalty. There are certain categories of crime, most of them murder, although one we'll talk about in a little bit is drug trafficking, where the federal government can prosecute someone to be put to death. And the federal government has concurrent jurisdiction with the states on a lot of these crimes. In other words, even though you committed the crime in, say, Missouri, you can be prosecuted by the federal government for committing crimes like capital murder or drug trafficking. And the federal government may prosecute you on the question of you violated federal law. The military also has the death penalty. And while I didn't look into this specifically, this might be an interesting affirmative to run, especially for the idea that you can claim some benefits specific to federal government action in the military because the federal government has control over the military. And 28 states have the death penalty. Now there has been a growing trend at the state level against the death penalty. So more and more states have been banning the death penalty or putting moratoriums on the death penalty, which is that the governor will put a moratorium on the death penalty, which means they won't use it. It's still on the books but they won't use the death penalty. And one of the reasons why there have been an increased number of moratoriums on the death penalty is because governors think the death penalty is applied in an unfair manner. And when we talk about some of the advantages to death penalty affirmatives, one of the things we'll know is that it's not applied in a fair manner, particularly on the grounds of race the race of both the defendant and the race of the victim matter a great deal in whether or not someone is going to be put to death. So this chart shows you the death penalty in the United States today. The green means you have the death penalty. The blue means you don't have the death penalty. My home state of Alabama, continuing its fine traditions, has the death penalty whereas the state of Michigan is in blue and they don't have the death penalty. One interesting thing you may note is that a lot of the swing states do not have the death penalty. So you look at Wisconsin, you look at Michigan, you look at Minnesota, they all don't have the death penalty, which will be relevant when we talk on the negative about the idea that getting rid of the death penalty might be popular in some of the swing states. But a slim majority of the country, 28 out of 50 states, do have the death penalty. And some of them, like the state of Alabama, are nowhere near getting rid of the death penalty. They're going to have the death penalty for a very long time. And they believe in putting people to death because they think it deters crime. What do you have to do to get the death penalty? Well, we use the death penalty almost exclusively for murder in the United States. And no one has been executed for a non-murder offense since 1976. But there are crimes that are not directly murder related that you can be put to death for. So Trump has expanded the death penalty to include drug trafficking. And his attorney general, William Barr, is a big fan of the death penalty and wants to use the death penalty to help solve the opioid epidemic by going after the drug traffickers in opioids to prevent people from becoming addicted to opioids.
And so Trump has told Barr and Barr has followed through that the death penalty has been expanded to include drug trafficking. There's a really tiny affirmative that you could run of just getting rid of the death penalty for drug trafficking. And I've actually found a solvency card for that affirmative that says just having the death penalty on the books for drug trafficking encourages authoritarian nations to put people to death for drug trafficking. So likely going to be used as a solvency deficit to the state's counterplan when you're running your death penalty affirmative. But if you were really sneaky, you might be able to come up with a way to run an entire affirmative around that provision in federal law. The federal government has also announced it will resume executions. So I believe it was 2003 was the last time that someone was put to death by the federal government. But Trump is trying to expedite those executions. He's trying to take people off death row and literally kill them because he thinks the death penalty is a good deterrent. So the federal government has ratcheted up the death penalty. And it's only been the last couple of months that the Circuit Court of D.C. authorized the use of the death penalty again in the United States at the federal level. So the federal government is trying to make sure that more people get executed, the ones that they have on death row. And that's probably something worth explaining, is that if you're convicted to death, you don't immediately go get put to death. They don't immediately put the needle in your arm and put you to death. You go on death row, which is basically you're in prison, obviously, a really clamped down, very secure prison that prevents you from escaping while you wait to get put to death. But some people will die on death row, meaning that they've stayed in prison so long that they die on death row. How many people get the death penalty? Well, 1,518 people have been executed in the U.S. since the 1970s. And in 2019, 22 death row inmates were executed. And 20 of those were done by lethal injection and two by electrocution in Tennessee. And 2,620 prisoners are on death row in the United States in 2020. So that should give you a sense as to how big your affirmative is, how many people you are dealing with. If you ban the death penalty, how many people would you affect? Well, obviously, if you ban the death penalty, those 2,620 prisoners on death row would not be put to death. How does one get the death penalty? Well, one thing to understand is that the death penalty happens at the sentencing phase of a trial. A criminal trial has two phases. It has the guilt phase and it has the sentencing phase. More often than not, in shows like Law and Order, you see the guilt phase. That's where you determine, did this person commit the crime or not? And if the judge or the jury find that they didn't commit the crime, you never go to the sentencing phase because the person didn't commit the crime. But if the suspect committed the crime, there's a second phase of the trial. And in death penalty cases, it is decided by a jury. Sometimes for some crimes, it's decided by the judge, but to increase the procedural protections of the death penalty in the sentencing phase, a jury has to determine that the suspect is worthy of being put to death. And so they have another trial with some different rules. The evidentiary rules are a little more lax. So hearsay is allowed in sentencing phases. There's one episode of Law and Order where they can't get the tape in at the guilt phase, but they do get the tape in at the sentencing phase, which illustrates the different evidentiary standards in the guilt phase and the sentencing phase. But basically, they try and determine how bad of a person are you and how bad was the crime you committed? What are the aggravating and mitigating circumstances? Is the lawyer speak for this?
the aggravating circumstances are things the person did that make it more likely that they would be put to death. Maybe they did some really rotten things during the murder phase. They threw the body into a ditch. They callously gunned down a bunch of people. I don't want to give you too many specifics, but aggravating circumstances would be those that encourage the jury to say, hey, this person is really nasty, and what they did was really nasty, and they need to be put to death. Then there are mitigating circumstances. Maybe the person did it under self-defense. Maybe the person is a nice person. Maybe they unintentionally committed the murder, etc., which would be reasons why they would not get the death penalty at the sentencing phase. But the term is aggravating circumstances and mitigating circumstances. And those different circumstances are used by the jury to determine whether or not they feel that this person should be put to death. And I'm going to talk in a minute or two about the various court cases on this question. And one of the elements of the court cases is the jury has to be given a fair amount of discretion as to whether or not you get the death penalty. There can't be a law in the books that says you automatically get the death penalty for doing this. The jury has to have discretion, which means they get to decide whether or not the person gets the death penalty. How is the death penalty administered? Lethal injection is the primary method of execution in all 28 states that authorize the death penalty. So you can look over here at the various drugs and what they do to you, but they put together a cocktail of three different drugs that they inject in you in order to cause you to die. 16 states have a backup method of execution, so if they don't have the chemicals in order to put someone to death, they may use a backup method like Tennessee used the electric chair in those two cases, and so they have other means available to them. And if you're interested in the secondary methods, they include electrocution, lethal gas, hanging, nitrogen hypoxia, which prevents you from breathing, and the firing squad. But for the most part, what we're talking about when we talk about putting someone to death in the United States is we're talking about lethal injection. We don't use the electric chair very much anymore, I know when some of you think of the death penalty, you probably think to yourself that the person is getting electrocuted because you've seen that in a lot of movies or you've seen that in TV before, but the primary method of execution is in fact lethal injection. Now I'm going to talk to you about significant Supreme Court cases on the death penalty. And so there's been a lot of jurisprudence, which means there's been a lot of decisions and a lot of cases on the death penalty in the United States. So a really significant one is Furman versus Georgia in 1972, which struck down the death penalty in the United States. And that might surprise you that at one moment in time, the death penalty was considered to violate the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution's clause on cruel and unusual punishment. So in Furman, the court said that all death penalty schemes in the United States were too arbitrary and therefore they were unconstitutional under cruel and unusual punishment. So the states and the federal government went, oh shoot, we've got to fix our death penalty statutes or the court's going to say they're unconstitutional. So they went back and they looked at the specific standards in Furman and they tried to make it more specific and they tried to decrease the arbitrariness. In other words, they tried to make sure that only the worst people were getting the death penalty. Judge Blackman in Furman said that it was like getting struck by lightning, your odds of getting the death penalty, as opposed to you committed a really heinous crime and you did it in a really heinous manner. And so they came back in 1976, specifically the state of Georgia again, in Greg v. Georgia, and Greg v. Georgia reaffirmed the use of the death penalty if there is clarity and objectivity in defining who is eligible and if 
juries had sufficient discretion in choosing whether or not to apply it. So Georgia went back and they fixed their statute and they made it more clear and they made it more objective and they gave juries more control. Now I say that and a lot of people don't think that the current standards of the death penalty are sufficient to make sure that there is clarity and objectivity and discretion in using it. And when I talk in the next video, I'm going to talk about how in particular people are concerned that it's not applied well due to the race of the defendant and the race of the victim. In other words, a lot of African Americans get the death penalty and in particular, a lot of people who kill someone who is white as opposed to someone who is black get the death penalty. You'll notice that there's a trend right now, as you can see in the various cases, towards decreasing the scope of the death penalty. So in Atkins v. Virginia, the death penalty was abolished for mentally disabled offenders. So if the person has a very low IQ, they can't be put to death because they weren't cognizant of their actions. In Ring versus Arizona, juries and not judges find the facts that make a defendant eligible for the death penalty. So I talked before about the idea that in a lot of trials at the sentencing phase, the judge decides what the sentence is going to be. Not the case in the death penalty. In the death penalty, a jury decides what makes the defendant eligible for the death penalty. Roper v. Simmons, the death penalty was abolished for juvenile offenders, and in Hearst v. Florida, juries, not judges, impose the death sentence. So they both find the facts and they impose the death sentence. But there's been a general narrowing of the death penalty. Not only do less states use it, but the Supreme Court is on a trend to decrease the use of the death penalty. Now I say that, and all of those cases are before we got Trump's appointees of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, so we'll look to the future to see what they do with the death penalty. One thing seems clear, though, is that the Supreme Court is not going to strike down the death penalty anytime soon. They will keep it active in some way, shape, or form which is why you want to be affirmative and have the Supreme Court strike down the death penalty, which will be what we talk about in the next lecture.